Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the True Blue Crime Podcast. My name is Dan, and as always, I will be your host for this episode. This is going to be a shorter episode for the first time in the history of the podcast. I started researching a case this morning that I thought I could squeeze into one episode before our flyover country episode that is slotted for tomorrow. However, I quickly realized that I was getting too deep in the weeds on that case. There's just too much to cover and I didn't want to make a one and a half hour episode. And I also didn't want to cut out a half hour of content. So the episode that I was working on this morning is now going to turn into a two part episode that will air on Saturday and Sunday. And I instead quickly researched and found this episode to cover today. So before we get into the episode, if you'd like to get any updates about what the podcast is up to, please like and follow the True Blue Crime Productions Facebook page. And if you'd like to email the host directly, my email is truebluecrimeproductions at gmail.com. And if you can, please support the show via Patreon. Any donation level helps and any donations will receive a shout out in a future podcast. For no cost whatsoever, please rate and review the show on whatever platform you're listening to. It definitely helps spread the listenership. And without any further ado, let's dive into this episode of True Blue Crime. The past few years have seen a rapid growth in the industry of rental vacation homes. Sites such as VRBO and Airbnb offer an alternative style of lodging than your typical hotel resort. While some vacation rental homes allow you to access the entire house, others are partial home rentals, and while the websites offering these partial home rentals are new, the idea of a bed and breakfast has been popular for almost 100 years. While people did rent out part of their homes throughout history, the dedicated bed and breakfast idea took off in the London area in the 1940s. Lacking accommodation for the influx of Allied troops that were helping the RAF, the Royal Air Force, and eventually troops that took part in the planning of D-Day, people were happy to set aside bedrooms in their home for sleeping quarters and allow their guests to eat meals with them and relax in the common areas. The idea of a bed and breakfast grew from there and now most establishments are historical style homes where the owners live year round and provide food, lodging, and in some cases recreational activities for their guests. They often serve communities that are too small to have a dedicated hotel or resort style accommodation, but exist in an area where people may want to travel and relax. An example of such a community is Newry, Maine. Located just a short drive off the Appalachian Trail, the city is known for its beautiful views of the mountains to the north, and it's less than two hour drive to the towns of Portland, Maine and the Atlantic Ocean. Offering alpine skiing in the winter, the town of roughly 411 people enjoys a nice mix of small town life and the tourism economy. But this quaint little town would be rocked by a series of four murders over the Labor Day weekend in 2006. 50 year old James Whitehurst would not have been your typical Maine resident. Born in California and spending his childhood between California and Florida, it would have taken James time to settle into the harsh Maine winters. But children have a way of making those sacrifices worth it, and that is exactly what brought James to Maine. He was fighting for custody of his kids, who had been taken to Maine from Arkansas by his common-law wife. Finding work in a small town, especially for someone who isn't local, isn't always easy, but James landed a job as the handyman at the Black Bear Bed and Breakfast in Newry. The bed and breakfast was a remodeled farmhouse and inn located along the Sunday River just west of town. The farmhouse featured seven bedrooms on a quiet property just south of the Appalachian Mountains and across the river from the Sunday River ski area. The location would be the perfect getaway for a couple on a date weekend or someone doing a more comfortable trek down the Appalachian Trail. The inn was owned by 65-year-old Julie Bullard and she allowed James Whitehurst to live on the property in exchange for his work around the grounds. Julie had purchased the property a few years prior and fixed it up, having moved here from San Francisco and putting her own touch on the property itself. However, the property was now up for sale due to increasing costs of keeping the the property running and lack of revenue. The bed and breakfast did have another full-time resident a man named Christian Nielsen, who was a 31-year-old cook who had been living at the bed and breakfast for a few months and worked in the kitchen at a nearby inn. 
It was Labor Day weekend 2006, and on Friday, September 1st, Nielsen invited Whitehurst to go fishing with him in Upton, Maine, which is roughly 10 to 15 miles away from Newry. Whitehurst accepted this invite, and after fishing, Nielsen would show up for his shift on Friday at the inn before returning to the Black Bear Bed and Breakfast on Friday night. By Monday, September 4th, he was under arrest for four murders, and this beautiful little town was in shock. Charles Nielsen, Christian's father, received a call from his son on Labor Day in which Christian stated he would be running the Black Bear bed and breakfast temporarily while the owner was in California. Christian had stopped by his father's house earlier that day to borrow a chainsaw, and now Charles was stopping by the Black Bear. It's unknown if this was due to the chainsaw or out of some type of concern for his son, but upon arrival, Charles and his wife, who is Christian's stepmom, is going to find a body outside the Black Bear Inn and immediately call 911. While state police were en route, Nielsen would confess to his stepmother that he had killed some people and she called 911 to inform law enforcement of the confession. Christian was taken into custody when officers arrived and he put up no resistance. Investigators would find three deceased humans and three deceased dogs on the property. However, missing from the property was James Whitehurst. The bodies of the three deceased women were identified as Julie Bullard, the owner, her 30-year-old daughter, Selby Bullard, and Selby's friend, 43-year-old Cindy Beetson. The bodies had all been mutilated. Julie had been dismembered by a hacksaw and an axe, and the other two women had been dismembered via the chainsaw borrowed from Charles. Christian would make a full confession to his crimes, detailing the events of the weekend to investigators. But who was Christian Nielsen? So Christian Nielsen was born on May 2nd, 1975. His father, Charles, was an English teacher in a town in Maine. His mother left his father when Christian was four, and by age six, his father had sole custody of of Christian and his sister due to his mother's battle with emotional stability. He was described as having a normal childhood, and after high school, Christian went on to study at the University of Maine. He attended the University of Maine between 2001 and 2004, but he did not obtain a degree. He would later say during his time at college, he would start having fantasies about becoming a serial killer. In the years following him leaving college, Christian appeared to have a substance abuse problem and had his driver's license taken away from a DWI. However, he continued to drive, getting citations for driving without a license, and eventually landed his living accommodations at the Black Bear Bed and Breakfast around July of 2006. He was described as a quiet and hard worker, and people said he liked to read and frequented a bookstore in his hometown of Farmington, Maine. The owner there said Christian's personality was unpredictable. Sometimes he was outgoing, and other times he was very closed off. The owner said Christian appeared to be a very bright young man who favored classic literature. Now, the information is vague, but from everything I could read in the research, it appears that Christian was having troubles paying his rent at the Black Bear. It was surmised that Whitehurst was given the job of evicting Christian, but it didn't seem like it was an immediate situation. I'll take a side from the story here and discuss. There's only about five or six articles out there in regards to this case, and a lot of them have the same information. I was able to get some information from some of the articles that didn't exist in others, but there's not a great breakdown in regards to exactly what was going on with Christian and uh, the Black Bear at this time. There was just talk about Christian not paying his rent and speculation and I think at least one of the articles that Julie may have asked Whitehurst to ask Christian to leave and when asked why he killed Whitehurst there's a couple different quotes that Christian gave and I don't know which one is accurate or if either of them are even accurate but it was something along the lines of that they had differences um, like difference of differences of opinion or something along those lines. Uh, but as we're going to see, I think it's going to spell out just based on the research that what I think happened was that Whitehurst 
likely told him that he was going to need to be packing up his stuff and leaving at some point, but it wasn't something where it was grab your stuff and go. It was more along the lines of he hadn't paid rent, and so they were kind of giving him some time to, to figure things out and leave, but he had probably been told at that point that he was going to have to leave. And as I mentioned earlier, the, Julie had actually put up the black bear for sale i want to say it was like february of 2006 is when it went up for sale and this is seven months later i guess and this is 2006 so this is kind of right in the beginning if not already into the housing crisis uh i should say the mortgage crisis real estate crisis whatever you want to call it, the bubble bursting in, in real estate even regular houses in normal communities with all the foreclosures and everything that was going on the at that time we had those adjustable rate mortgages and I, again i wish there was more information out there about the case and maybe that was what julie had run into here is that she had gotten a mortgage for this black bear that the rate was going to adjust and she couldn't afford to run it anymore it looked like she had done a lot of work to it the pictures online looked really nice and it had said that there was like a tennis court and a pool on the property so i mean this was a pretty nice place and then some places said it was a seven bedroom other places said it was a six bedroom i'm gonna think that maybe since julie lived on the property maybe it was something where there were six bedrooms available to rent so it was being reported two different ways there but ultimately Julie was really only letting Christian live there because he was supposed to be paying a, a steady rent, which would help her with the bills. Because as we're going to find out, it's lucky that nobody else was living there full time other than James. James had a room, but that was an agreement between him and Julie that he would keep up the property. So she didn't have labor costs, but she had to give up one of the rooms to rent. But this is going to be Labor Day weekend, and there are no other guests. So I don't know if because the place was for sale, she had already stopped renting to seasonal guests or what. But I, I would assume that Labor Day weekend, kind of the, the last official weekend of summer, that that would have been a weekend in which you would have expected at least a couple of the rooms at this bed and breakfast to be rented. And the fact that they weren't makes me question whether she was still really operating it as a bed and breakfast but again this is just all the stuff i read into thinking about the, the year that this was happening all the other stuff that was happening with real estate and mortgages and what and whatnot at that time and just kind of putting two and two together as best i can to create a picture of potentially what happened here because in reality there's not going to be a whole lot of answers as to why christian did what he did and there's only information as to what the arrangements were prior to everything that's going to happen. So I'm just, again, spitballing here, thinking of some ways that that this might have all happened. And if you know, Whitehurst had talked to Christian earlier in the week and said, hey, you need to get your stuff and get out of here at some point, but it doesn't have to be today. Yes, there would have been a clock ticking in the back of Christian's head, like, I need to leave here at some point. But at the same time, it, that wouldn't necessarily indicate that there was bad blood between him and Whitehurst. So the fact that Christian invited him to go fishing likely would not have erased any alarm bells in Whitehurst, Whitehurst's head at that point that anything sinister was going to go down. So as I talked about, likely Julie had James tell Christian that he needed to find a new place to stay, and it, but he was given time to figure it out, and Christian likely didn't have any other options. I'm guessing that when Christian found a bed and breakfast that either was not operating at that time, or at least was struggling to operate, that he probably got some pretty good deal for what he was going to be charged for rent each month to stay there. And he probably wasn't going to find that type of a deal on rent anywhere else and likely didn't have anywhere else lined up. And if he didn't have money to pay the cheap rent, he likely wasn't going to have money to pay rent that was going to be more expensive. So he's kind of caught in this, if I leave, I'm basically homeless mentality. So likely he kind of 
started to panic a bit and whether there was an argument between him and Whitehurst out on this fishing trip or whether Christian just was going to follow through on his ideas that he wanted to be a serial killer. Uh, he ends up shooting uh, James Whitehurst in the back of the head a couple times while they're out in the wooded area uh, about 10 to 15 miles or minutes away from Newry. Uh, it was said that they had subway together for lunch so again it's, it doesn't seem like something where there's animosity between the two of them. The witnesses would later say they shared this lunch together at subway everything seemed normal and then that afternoon sometime between them eating lunch together and Christian showing up for his shift at the kitchen at the inn near in nearby I think it was Bethel was the name of the town that he worked in he shoots James Whitehurst twice not a lot of information other than just those are the specifics those are the facts that we know Christian would work that shift at the inn everybody said he acted completely normal and then returned to to stay in the black bear the next day he would go back to where the uh, he had shot Whitehurst, and he started to dig a shallow grave. And one thing that people don't realize, I guess, in, you, if you watch movies, it seems like people digging graves, you know, it's like 15, 20 minutes, and they've got this six foot deep by six foot long grave. And if you've ever actually dug outside of say in a garden where the soil is meant to be easy to dig through if you're digging out in the woods where there's tree roots and rocks and all kinds of stuff even with a really good shovel it's going to take you a while to move that much dirt to, di to dig a hole big enough to put a body in so that's why a lot of these killers especially ones that don't have things planned out will attempt to dig a grave which ends up being a shallow grave and then as in this case Christian's going to decide that the grave completely burying Whitehurst is too much work so he's just going to light him on fire which again shows kind of a state of panic or lack of thought because it's very difficult to fully cremate someone just via gasoline and a match uh, the human body is just not designed to burn to ashes that way. So what he ends up with is Whitehurst's body partially burned in a shallow grave. Now he's going to return to the Black Bear. And I didn't find out if he had a shift on Saturday or not. I didn't mention anything in the research. But it's going to say that on Sunday he decides that he needs to eliminate Julie as well as she's going to start to have questions if she hasn't already about where James Whitehurst is. I can only imagine that this is a small town. There's not a whole lot to do. I mean, there is recreational activities, but if you're the handyman in a bed and breakfast and you likely don't have much of a social life, Julie was probably used to Whitehurst being around a lot more. So when he leaves on Friday and now it's Sunday and she hasn't seen or heard anything of him, she's probably going to be start to ask him questions and she knows he left with Christian. So whether or not there was questions asked towards Christian about James or comments made about if, if James we don't see James or hear from James tomorrow, I'm calling the police. Something along those lines may have been said or insinuated. For whatever reason, Christian decides... He needs to eliminate Julie, so he kicks down her door while she's sleeping and shoots her three times, once in the head, the back, and the chest, killing her. And this is on Sunday. He is going to then take her body out into the backyard, and he decides he needs to hide it under this tarp, so he ends up dismembering the body with a hacksaw. And it said an axe in one article, and then it said a pickaxe in another article. It doesn't really matter. Ultimately, he's going to dismember her and put her under this tarp and then go work his shift on Sunday night at the kitchen and act like nothing had happened. Monday morning, this is Labor Day itself, September 4th is going to roll around, and Julie's daughter, Selby, and her friend are going to show up this on this morning. 
They're there to check on Julie because she had asthma and would, would get into coughing fits. And when they couldn't reach her by phone, they decided to drive over there and see what was going on. And Christian would later say that when they showed up asking where Julie was, he panicked and shot both women in the head. Now, this is going to be morbid, as a lot of this stuff is, but likely having dismembered Julie's body and finding it was a lot of work to be done by hand. This is when Christian drives over to his father's house to bar borrow the chainsaw to make the job easier. He uses the chainsaw to dismember the other women's bodies in the yard. And then he calls his father, and that's when he tells his dad that he's going to be temporarily running the Black Bear Inn while Julie's in California. Now, Julie was from California and said that she had you know, purchased the place and moved there from San Francisco. But I don't know, and the research didn't say whether this triggered some type of an alarm in uh, his father Charles's head as to, hey, my son just borrowed a chainsaw, which is probably something that Christian didn't do very often. It's, And he may have even had an excuse, he may have even said that some work needed to be done around the property, but I don't know the specifics of it, but I don't know if it was this phone call where his father just felt this is just something's going on here. I don't know if it's father instinct that he heard something in Christian's voice that wasn't right or what it was, but this phone call is going to cause Charles to drive over there and check on Christian and the black bear, and this is where they're going to find the women's bodies and call the police. Now, during his confession, Christian would tell uh, the investigators about James Whitehurst's body, and he's going to lead them to the spot where he attempted to, to bury the body and then burn it. And so ultimately, uh, investigators are going to have a pretty open and shut case here in terms of the the four murder victims, four bodies recovered, the suspect admitting to it, confessing to it. Now, he would get a public defender, which this attorney is going to advise Nielsen not to, or to plead not guilty to the murders. And this is to buy some time so that they can get a psychological exam done on Nielsen. There were some issues in the news media where when he was arrested, he would often smile or smirk at the cameras as if he was proud of what he did or happy about what he did, however you want to look at it. And this obviously upset a lot of people and made him look like he was either completely evil or completely insane and evil. The, the attorney or his attorney is going to have him do a psych exam and the psychologist is going to find him to suffer from schizoid disorder and it just said Asperger's and other mental illness. So we'll break down the schizoid disorder first and we talked about that in the yeah, Unabomber case. That's what Ted Gazinski was described. I mean, one one psychologist said paranoid schizophrenic, but the other one just said, no, he's not paranoid. He's just schizoid. And basically, schizoid just means that they have trouble socializing and have troubles forming intimate bonds with other people. And as a result, they are less likely to feel empathy towards others or remorse for their actions the, the disorder itself does not prevent him from knowing right from wrong and we've talked before about that being the, the main uh, measuring stick when it comes to to if whether they could be found criminally responsible or not so he's got the schizoid disorder that doesn't disqualify him from being charged and potentially convicted of these crimes asperger's it's a form of high functioning autism and usually affects more of again those social cues those social understanding some behavioral stuff but not to the point of knowing not knowing right from wrong and then it's just that other mental illnesses clearly i would assume if there was a mental illness in that diagnosis that would relate to a complete loss of psychological function it would have been brought up i think the major ones were the schizoid and the asperger's and neither of those disqualified him from being able to stand trial 
So it was shortly after the not guilty plea that the lawyer tried to change his plea to not cr criminally responsible, but the judge is going to review the psychological test and he's going to rule correctly that Christian understood right from wrong at the time of the, cri uh, time of the crimes could go through the trial. Now Christian did not want a trial and instead ch just chose to plead guilty to four counts of murder and was sentenced to four life sentences. Some of the sources said these are four concurrent life sentences, and some said there were four consecutive. And I think sometimes not even the crime reporters pay attention to this stuff when I read it. I, it's maybe that one thing is accurate, and they just assume that one thing means the same as the other. Ultimately, Maine is another one of these states, and I'm shocked by this because I'm, I'm from a state where life doesn't mean life, but in Maine is another one of these states where if you get prison, in prison for life, it's life. A life sentence has no parole automatically attached to it. So ultimately it doesn't matter. It would, given his age is 31 at the time of the crimes, if they were concurrent and it was a state where life means 20 years and then eligible for parole, he'd be 51 when he's eligible for parole. And in fact, he'd be coming up on parole at this point. But if they're four consecutive life sentences, that's a minimum of 80 years. He's not likely going to be paroled unless he makes it to 111. So, again, it doesn't matter in this case. It would in other states, but it doesn't matter in Maine. He's going to be in prison for the rest of his life and away from society. Now, some discussion points that I wanted to bring up. So the one thing they did point out is that his lawyer would argue not just that he wasn't competent to stand trial, but that he was, or sorry, that he was, not that he was, argued that he was just mentally incapable of committing the crime. He would also argue that he was not competent to stand trial. There are some major differences between the two. Somebody who is going to plead guilty by reason of insanity, and we've discussed this before, they are going to go through the trial and the judge is going to recognize they admit their guilt, but that they suffered from such a psychological lapse and lack of knowledge from right or wrong at the time of the murders that they cannot be found criminally liable for their actions and they're going to need serious mental help. And, and instead of going to prison, they're going to go to a secure mental health facility. So when people plead guilty by reason of insanity, the only way that's really going to work out is if after who somebody committed the actions they committed that they almost make no further action at that point to show that the, they know what they did was wrong so had he killed these people and just kind of left them where they were and acted like it was no big deal and then other people find him and he just gives some excuse about how some some god of his told him that these people were gonna bring the world to an end and he needed to kill them to, to save everybody else and then he was told to leave the body you know something along those lines then there's a chance for the insanity defense but as soon as he starts making efforts to cover up his crimes which is dig the graves or dig the grave burn the body dismember the bodies hide them under tarps he knows he's not supposed to kill people and he knows that if somebody walks in there he's gonna get caught and that's was even his reason for killing Julie was that she was going to find out that James Whitehurst wasn't around anymore. So he knows what he's doing is wrong. So he's not going to stand that. Now, the other half of that is not competent to stand trial. And that's where an attorney is going to argue that their client doesn't understand the scope of the trial and can't cooperate in his own or her own defense. If the attorney feels as if this person really doesn't understand that they're on trial for either their life or life in prison for the rest of their life and the, the psychiatric review shows that then i guess there's a chance that the judge could declare the person not fit to stand trial but in this case the judge is going to rule that christian's lack of cooperation with his own attorneys because it was said that christian wouldn't even tell his own attorneys why he did what he did and so his attorneys were struggling because, of course, they're going to try to think, can we come up with a self-defense argument? Can we, in this some way that that we 
can get lesser charges against this guy. Can we go, you know, a second degree murder charge? He didn't plan this stuff. It just happened. But Christian won't even tell him why he did what he did. So his attorneys are arguing that we can't effectively defend him because he won't cooperate with us. And the judge rules lack of cooperation from the client doesn't mean that he's not understanding of what's going on. It just means that he's a difficult client. The judge is going to rule that, and I think it's after all of these rulings that Christian's going to decide he's just going to plead. He doesn't want to sit through a trial, doesn't want to go through this stuff. He's just going to go to prison for the rest of his life. The one thing I did find interesting about this case is there wasn't really a, a true motive here. And the only thing I, that, again, reading into the the story itself is that his motive would have been to have a place to live, I guess, because he was going to get evicted, and then Julie was going to find out he killed the guy that was going to be evicting him, and then he could just, he claimed he thought he could just take over the resort, and he obviously called his dad to say that he was going to be temporarily taking care of the resort. But one thing in the reading that I did see was that Selby, the daughter of Julie that he ends up killing, he knew her they were roughly the same age it's a small town so they're gonna run into each other know each other so it's not like he's gonna be there Tuesday morning if Selby hadn't shown up Monday and by Tuesday Selby showing up and saying hey where's my mom it's not like he's gonna be able to say oh she went to California she left me in charge at some point somebody was gonna come looking for Julie and in this case somebody that Christian knows I mean, it's the motive to take over the the bed and breakfast just doesn't make any sense because there's not a solid end game there, and that's maybe make makes me question the other mental illnesses and the Aspergers is whether or not that did maybe have a role in that that he had this just terrible terrible plan and it, he just doesn't think things out long term, and that's the other thing I realized is that. I'm doing the research and I saw he was born in 1975 and that's six years after me and he's going to college after I started college. So there's an eight year gap from 93 to 2001. He likely would have graduated high school in 93 and then it says he attends college in 2001 and there's nothing about what he was doing in those eight years but that's again a real danger time for people when they're having mental illness issues and substance abuse issues is that time frame of the late teens and early 20s and just makes me wonder if he didn't have a lot of issues with either his mental health or substance abuse during that time period and it just it's not reported but I for one it just made me curious because it made me think did he do something during that time period that hasn't been discovered but ultimately, again, what he did was heinous enough. He ends these four people's lives for basically no reason. And hurts a, a small community, takes away mothers and father, a father and everything. But again, this was a case, A, I didn't really plan on doing right now. I had it on my list of cases to cover because I'm trying to work my way all around the country. I don't want to just do cases from... A certain region and it seems when I do the research also I find out I've already done two cases out of South Carolina and I've already done you know working on a second case out of Colorado and so I'm trying to get them all around the US and so I figured this was one of my lists or one of the cases out of Maine that I wanted to do at some point so I figured since it was gonna be a shorter episode I'd be able to get it researched and recorded and edited today and that actually gives me a chance to do the bigger episode in two parts on Saturday and Sunday and not be so rushed to get it out anyway because all three of my boys have a soccer tournament this weekend so there's going to be a lot of podcasting and soccer coming up this weekend but I appreciate you guys listening if you guys have want any further updates like I said check out that Facebook page at True Blue Crime Productions and if you have any questions or comments, email me at productions at gmail.com. Support me on Patreon if you can. Otherwise, that's it for this episode. Hope you guys have a great day. Talk to you later. Goodbye.